Welcome to Washington State Wire's virtual conversation with some of Washington State's most thoughtful policy leaders. And now your host, DJ Wilson. Hello and welcome to another debate here hosted by the Washington State Wire. We're super honored to have you with us. We've got about a thousand people here registered to be with us tonight and two statewide candidates running for office to hold the position of superintendent of public instruction. Maya Espinoza and Chris Reichdahl will be with us here. They're here with us now already, but I'll introduce them here in a second. First, I want to give you a little orientation to this evening's uh, show and how you can be engaged. We have, as you see, of course, the, the chat box on the right of our video. And uh, if you'll look closely, you'll see Q&A and you'll see handouts and, and polls. I don't expect we'll have too many polls tonight, though we may throw one at you. But your questions can certainly appear. And, and uh, when you type those into the Q&A box, I would encourage you to upvote, to, to select, to prioritize those questions that you find most interesting. If we have time you know, over the course of the evening, I'll make sure that we integrate those into our conversation, likely towards the end of the evening. And I'll start with those questions that are at the top of the list. So the bottom of the list is uh, the, the, the most recent question, of course, but the highest priority question will be those that have been upvoted near the top. The other thing I'd say is that we are bringing this to you uh, here at The Wire with a thousand folks and in participation uh, in collaboration with TVW, who will broadcast this statewide. We're doing it because we believe in the importance of civic conversation and civic engagement. We are doing this for free and we're honored to have you all with us, but it's not free to produce this. Our media and our content that we generate at The Washington State Wire is supported by you, people who believe in civic conversation that is nonpartisan policy agnostic, but which tees up the most important challenges and the most pressing questions facing our state. So if you like what you see tonight, we'd love to have your support at The Wire, which you can find at washingtonstatewire.com slash support. All right, and before I introduce our two candidates directly, let me just say that we, we're in a really polarizing time and politics is not easy, but we are better together than we are apart. And the fact that we've got two folks dedicating their time and sacrificing both time and energy and resource to be candidates for office is uh, a remarkable testament to our community and to our democracy. Uh, Maya and Chris, you make our democracy stronger, so thank you for your service as candidates. First, I wanna introduce uh, Maya Espinoza, a candidate running for the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. And joining her, of course, is Chris Reichdahl, also a candidate. And we're gonna start right off with our uh, opening comments tonight, and we're gonna start with Mr. Reichdahl. Sir, you got two minutes to start us off. Thank you so much, and thank you everybody for tuning in. I'm Chris Rakedell, Superintendent of Public Schools. I'm a born and raised Washingtonian, um, and really it was public education. That was my real out in life. Um, I love my brothers and sisters and my parents, but we grew up with a lot of struggle uh, on public assistance. My parents both had an eighth grade education, and uh, there was a lot of alcoholism in our family. And so I went to school, and I loved it. And, and it was really early in my life that I said, I really want to give back to this in any way I can. So I've spent my life in public ed as a certificated public school teacher, a school board member. Um, I've served on an education uh, foundation, 14 years with our community and technical colleges, and obviously in this role now. So I'm really grateful for, for the opportunity to serve and to spend a career trying to make opportunity for kids the way that I had um, in my childhood. I've loved our work for the last four years. It's been hard and complicated, but record high graduation rates, even as students take more rigorous coursework, um, we've got more kids going on to post-secondary. We've opened up grad pathways to career and technical education work. We've got bilingual programs growing as rapidly as they ever have. And we're a top 15 state in the nation now in performance in math and English language arts using the only common assessment in the country. So we've made incredible headway in this state, uh, but we've got real challenges ahead. And obviously COVID is one that we want to work through and manage carefully, respect local control on that, give them the guidance and support that they need as they make very difficult decisions to slowly bring back students in a way that is safe. We don't wanna be Georgia where we race back, close it all down again. We wanna be smart about this, but really glad to be here. Thank you so much and thank you for the opportunity to serve. Yeah, Chris, thank you for your candidacy. Maya, welcome to the conversation. Thank you for your candidacy. You have two minutes for your opening comments. 
Thanks so much, DJ. It's a pleasure to be here with The Wire this evening. My name is Maya Espinoza. I'm a statewide candidate for this office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, one that doesn't normally get this much attention, but so important right now, particularly given everything that's going on in this educational context in our state. So first and foremost, I'm a mom with kids in public school happening online right now. They're supposed to be in school. Um, and I think that, you know, really brings a specific perspective to this conversation tonight. So I like to say first and foremost, I'm a mom with skin in the game. I've also been a small business owner for several years. I've run a nonprofit as the head of the Center for Latino Leadership. And I was a school music teacher, teaching kindergarten through eighth grade, 100 kids in one day. You know, of all the jobs I've held, this is honestly something that was both the most challenging and rewarding thing I've ever experienced. So certainly appreciate what teachers do. Um, Recently, I was recruited for a global education forum where we looked at education models around the world, and I was really inspired by what I saw. But, you know, when I came home a little bit disheartened by the rigidity of our school system and how it continues to leave some students behind. My opponent is going to tell you this evening why he thinks I'm not qualified or experienced enough for this job. But I would ask you to ask yourself, what has that experience gotten us? Are you satisfied with how we're providing education in this state? And I'll tell you that as a parent and a community leader myself, I've been frustrated. And I think that this time of COVID where a majority of school districts are now operating online exclusively, we have a chance to do something different. And I'm running to reimagine an education system that works for all of Washington families. It's you know big and bold, but we have to do it. And this is really a, a, an, a historic opportunity Good. to do something different. So I'm happy much. to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So for our questions this evening, we have uh, written them and researched them in such a way that we hope can provide a little bit of context to uh, each candidate's uh, positions and views about the issues so in most cases, we ask questions directly to the candidate, and then we'll ask another question uh, directly to the next candidate. Uh, in some cases, those uh, uh, questions will have an opportunity to have follow-up, but not every uh, question has that opportunity. If at any time folks or either of our candidates would like to jump in, they can, but we will deduct that uh, time from them later in the evening so that we can make sure we're as even as, and as balanced as possible. And I'll, I'll retain the discretion to ask them to not answer and not follow up if needed. Uh, but we wanna make sure people that are our candidates here can have as full of an offering, full, full of an opportunity to uh, tell you about their position as possible. So question one is on sex education. And uh, it's on the ballot this year. Ms. Espinosa, I'll give you this first question. Uh, referendum 90, as you know, asks whether Senate Bill 5395 should be repealed or not. This legislation passed this year by the legislature requires that, quote, every public school shall provide comprehensive sexual health education to each student by the 2022-23 school year. The curriculum, instruction, and materials used to provide the comprehensive sexual education, sexual health education, must be medically and scientifically accurate, age appropriate, and inclusive of all students. It goes on to say that it must include information about abstinence and other methods of preventing unintended pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases. On your website, Ms. Espinoza, you say that you oppose this language because it would allow, quote, teaching fourth graders about sexual positions and teacher-led role play, end quote. That language does not appear in this legislation. So can you explain your opposition based on the substance of this, uh, this bill? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for the opportunity to do so. Um, the bill language that you read through some of it, uh, you know, I think the bill was written in a very, you know, um, meaningful way that was not intended to result in, you know, kids being handed inappropriate material. But unfortunately, that's exactly what we've seen. Some of the curriculum material that's already approved over this under the state's um, mandate includes some of this um, inappropriate material. And so we call out things like uh, materials for a fourth grade curriculum that expose sexual positions to fourth graders. And there are, you know, countless other examples, like we mentioned, teacher led role play, 
different things um, that we find inappropriate as parents and not age appropriate, despite the bill language saying that it is required that it be medically accurate and age appropriate. These are the issues with a top-down approach where we don't allow these curriculum decisions to be made at the local level. Um, certainly, again, I think the best of intentions were had, but this was made into a partisan issue by my opponent. I don't think sex ed was a partisan issue, and certainly we haven't seen that in other states. But the approach that my opponent took by championing this legislation, likening um, folks that disagreed with it to flat earthers or Holocaust deniers, I think really ignited a number of parents that do see some problems with this uh, particular curriculum. The law itself, if reversed, would simply mean that these decisions are still left up to local control. Yes, parents can opt out. Yes, school districts can come up with the curriculum as long as it meets you know, these standards A through G as outlined in this bill. Of course, that would be cost prohibitive to school districts and it's not realistic. When I talk to parents and school board members, they just feel that this is an extreme overreach by the state and I think my right. opponents to blame. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reichdahl. In this bill, Senate Bill 5395, it explicitly requires that kindergarten children be taught comprehensive sex education at least once a year in every school district in the state. Some supporters of the legislation are concerned that requiring this curricula to five-year-olds is too much too soon. Why do you think this sh should be required curricula for five-year-old children that may still be learning their ABCs? Thank you, and I appreciate that we get a chance to talk about this with the facts. Um, the legislature passed a bill like 29 other states that requires comprehensive sexual health education one in three girls and one in six boys graduates from our own school system uh, having been sexually abused or facing sexual assault in some form. So we have a public health crisis. Sexually transmitted infections are on the rise, of course. Um, this is a bill that gives parents the right to opt out. Local school boards pick their curriculum. Um, they notify parents. The K-3 curriculum specifically, and to be clear, it's one time between kindergarten and third grade. It's one lesson in fourth and fifth grade. It's two lessons in middle school and two lessons in high school at a minimum. So six lessons over 13 years. The kindergarten through third grade stuff is actually explicitly in the bill, not sexual health education. It's social emotional learning. The legislature made clear that these are the ages where you can teach kids about, do you have a safe adult? And you're teaching kids to make sure that they understand the, the, the sort of precursor of bullying, keeping their hands to themselves and controlling their emotions. It's the building blocks for safer behavior down the road. Um, and so there's nothing about sexual education uh, in the K-3 that was very explicit. Um, this is really about uh, what we have seen in many districts around the state, which is recognizing a public health crisis, putting professional experts in front of this, making sure that it's medically and scientifically accurate, that we empower parents along the way. And again, what we're trying to do is avoid um, assaults, abuse, um, unintended pregnancies, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, and other components of this. Um, you know, the last thing I'll say about this, of course, is um, there's a lot of speculation uh, and fear, and it's not borne out by the facts. Uh, the opponents continue to say that there are sexual positions as a part of this. A court in Thurston County clearly said that is untrue. Um, there is a book written by a third-party author uh, for parents only. Uh, that is what is being referenced here. It is not in the curriculum. Uh, this is not evidenced anywhere. Nobody in the state teaches that. So it's not in the law. It's not on the state standards. It's not in the curriculum. It's not in teacher All lessons. Right. It's a political tactic. Very good. Thank you. Our next question it will remain with you, Mr. Rechtal. You've coordinated closely with Governor Inslee during this COVID pandemic, including the development of standards that would help inform local communities as they reopen their schools. Currently, every county in Western Washington, except for Grays Harbor, meets all of these criteria as established uh, for returning to a hybrid classroom model. Yet 94% of Washington State Public Schools are in a distance learning model of education. So why have you not been more vocal about the safety of children returning to school in a hybrid model, at least based on the state's own benchmarks? Yeah, thank you. We've been very vocal about that. In fact, we laid out a plan in January to open our schools to in-person instruction. Our cases, of course, at that time were really coming down, both total cases, hospitalizations, and mortalities. And so the plan is very clear. It's got a health framework that we partner with Department of Health on, hand hygiene, cleaning, screening students every day, face covering, six foot of physical distancing. Our districts worked really hard to open their schools. After 4th of July, the cases exploded again. Districts made the appropriate decision based on local control to say, let's start the year primarily remote. 
although we have several dozen districts that are fully face-to-face now um, or in hybrid models. Uh, but they have to make that decision locally because the state superintendent, despite what everyone will say, does not have the power uh, to force schools open or to close them, actually. Only the governor can close them or a health authority, and only local boards can open their schools in the model that they think is appropriate, safe, and healthy. Um, I want kids back. I really do, and I know this is emotional. Um, I have two kids in the system right now, and they're having their own um, struggles and sometimes strengths with it, uh, but it's really personal for me, uh, as it is for lots of folks. Uh, but our local school boards have this decision and they have a framework for how to open. Um, and it's not easy and it is not universally believed. Uh, there are communities within a community, some who want to come back, some who want hybrid and some who want to stay the distance. Um, so this is as tough as it gets. And right now is a time to really come together as local communities, solve that locally. Uh, but the guidance is there and our buildings are available today uh, for districts that want to bring students in small groups or one-on-one -on -one supports where the remote learning really isn't effective. So uh, I'm proud of the framework we've built. Districts are now reporting that over the next several weeks, more and more of them will open up hybrid slowly. We don't wanna be Georgia or Texas where we have districts open and shut down or have to close down for 14 days. That would be stunningly uh, dysfunctional for families. Very good. Ms. Espinoza, there are not many countries in the world that have restarted schools uh, over the summer, but Israel and uh, specifically Jerusalem is one of those countries. And there was a study out of Jerusalem uh, recently that showed a striking increase in infections among school-age kids as they returned to school in June. Those infections soon spread to the families, according to this study. Uh, now we find ourselves in September where Israel finds itself with the highest number of new cases per capita of any country in the world, possibly created in part by returning kids to school too early. On your website, you say about COVID, quote, we are not going to live in a zero infection Washington in the near future, so we have to manage the risks. Isn't managing the risks exactly what school districts across the state are doing by keeping distance learning in place? I think that is an attempt to mitigate the risk of not only COVID, but the risk of not being covered by insurance or the state um, through this lack of leadership and guidance in how to safely and sensibly reopen schools. Um, what we saw in Jerusalem is unfortunate, and certainly there are lessons to be learned there that we're finding out right now. Um, I, what you'll hear from my opponent, and I think what you just heard in his answer, is conflicting information. Um, you, you know, rightly point out that the majority, the vast majority of districts in our state are opting to stay online, even if they are well within um, the health guidelines to allow them to reopen. We're hearing from the superintendent's office, yes, go ahead and reopen, but at the same time, you're making the right decision not to. That's a total conflict. And school board members tell me, parents tell me, they want these students back and learning again. Certainly, I'm not proposing that we open the floodgates and put everyone back in school all at once, but there is science and data around how to sensibly and safely reopen schools. We'll certainly be looking at those school districts that are operating in a hybrid model right now and what their experience is like. But as a parent, we are left asking, why is it that these same school sites are open and operating daycares or learning centers build as, you know, academies on the same school sites that public school children do not have access to. So I think there is a real issue here and, and conflicting information. You know, you go out to a restaurant, we're allowed to go to a restaurant in, in groups of five, and yet kids cannot return to school and learn in groups of five. I think just again, as a parent, as someone who's got their kids online doing this, it's increasingly frustrated. And I think school districts and these communities have, left to, have been left to fend for themselves. Okay. Thank you. This next question will be uh, will remain with you, Ms. Espinoza, and I'll give Mr. Rechtal an opportunity to follow up. You'll have two minutes and Mr. Rechtal will have uh, one minute. Among your ed educational credentials, which you list in your voters' guide statement, Ms. Espinoza, you include a master's degree in curriculum and instruction from Western Governors University. According to reporting today by Michael Goldberg at The Wire, Western Governors University confirmed that you have not actually earned this degree yet. Can you first clarify whether your statement in the voters pamphlet about your education is correct or whether the Western Governors University, uh, whether their records are correct? And second, what do you think voters should take from this about your candidacy for public office? 
Well, I think it's a non-issue. You know, I'll, I'll invite you all to my graduation party here soon. Um, I have completed all the courses for this uh, master's degree. I'm still in the middle of my capstone project and still expect completion by the end of the month, well before voters' pamphlets are in the hands of voters. Uh, you know, my capstone project is, it could not be more timely right now in a context of online learning. So I, I'm excited, proud of my accomplishments. I'm not at all surprised that a white man in power wants to diminish my credentials as a young woman, um, you know, minority woman at that. Quite frankly, I'm used to that kind of thing and I'm not gonna take it personally. Mr. Rechtel, you have 60 seconds to respond. Um, so this was reporting, I think today, I have not read it, but um, this is a reporter who came to this conclusion and did this investigation. Uh, so that is an intriguing statement. I will say it isn't about a master's degree in this office. And, um, you know, straight from my heart, uh, whether I win this re-election or my opponent, we're going to work really hard and we're going to deliver the best that we can. And it doesn't take a master's degree. The question is integrity. It was in there in the primary. Voters thought that my opponent had a graduate degree in the very content area that would lead to success in this role. Um, it's about an opponent who did say She's not a politician is her opening line. And she just ran two years ago as a Republican and worked for the Senate Republican caucus. And so the pattern of, of being on the edge of truth, I think is the bigger issue here. And it's, and it's larger than this campaign. It's sort of where we are in America today. And I think it is troubling. Uh, a lower court has declared that her statement about sexual health education and the voter's guide statement is also okay. false. Thank so you. So we've got to be honest in this role. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Reichdahl, this question is for you for two minutes, and Ms. Espinosa, you'll have 60 seconds to respond as well. Uh, Mr. Reichdahl, you report fundraising $159,976, or a little over $21,000 more than your opponent. Of your amount, 58% of your fundraising comes from PACs, corporations, or political organizations, while 11% of your opponent's total funds raised are from similar organizations. So my question for you is whether you think money in politics is a problem and what voters should take from the fact that 58% of your funds come from PACs, corporations, or political organizations. Yeah, thank you. In Washington state, we have really good laws on donor limitations, both for organizations and individuals, uh, both in our race and in all races. We have the best public disclosure commission process. I encourage everyone to go look at our two PDCs. I encourage everyone to do that. Um, remember Trivial Pursuit, the little pie, and there was all kinds of even colors. My, my pie chart looks really balanced. I have lots of individuals. I have an equal amount that comes from labor, an equal amount that comes from business, an equal amount that comes from advocacy groups. All of these folks represent really important um, constituents in Washington state. Uh, the labor donations are a democratic process. They vote and, uh, their own resources into that. Our business leaders in this state, they employ hundreds of thousands of Washingtonians. And what I'm really proud of in our work is that we bring business and labor together. That's how we've expanded career and tech ed. That's how we've gotten higher graduation rates. That's how we've closed the gaps for students. Uh, our students of color are graduating at a faster rate than the overall average. This is a partnership between individual uh, people in the state of Washington, our labor partners, our business partners. And I am so glad about the balance that occurs in my donations. I'm very proud of it. I'll keep working hard to be inclusive and to bring everyone into the public education family. We need all of us rowing in the same direction to keep getting outcomes. And this is a state very, very committed to public ed and it's evidenced by the balance of my contributors. And I'm very, very proud of them and I'm grateful. Good, thank you. Ms. Espinoza, you have 60 seconds to respond. Well, I think the balance that he refers to in the pie chart is PACs, corporate, and special interests, other special interests here. Just a sliver of mine, and yeah, if you look at this imagery, it's pretty remarkable. Just a sliver of that is PACs uh, that you know were unsolicited, I, I'd say. I am proud of our grassroots funding and the fact that we are so close to Reichdahl in fundraising. We actually passed him at one point um, a couple of weeks ago in fundraising just on individuals. So I'm incredibly proud of our grassroots support. I, I think it's pretty clear from my opponent's funders um, who he works for. I'm proud to be working for the families of this state and not special interests. Very good. The next question will be from you, Ms. Espinoza, to Mr. Reichdahl. You'll have 30 seconds to ask Mr. Reichdahl a question and he will have 90 seconds to answer. So please go ahead with your question. 
Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to ask a question. So we've already given the chance to answer this question, but I'll, I'll give them one more chance. Very straightforward. Will you, Mr. Reichdahl, remove pornographic content such as the one that exposes sexual positions to fourth graders and remove that from the OSPI's website as approved curriculum? One word answer, yes or no. Mr. Reichdahl, you have 90 seconds to respond. Thank you, 90 seconds is appropriate. Uh, that doesn't exist and, and, and uh, I don't appreciate that you keep saying that. Please everyone go to the OSPI website. It is a publicly available website. You can see all the curriculums. Any district may use those. That's what's clear in the law or they may choose their own. Uh, they need to meet those learning standards. Um, this is a book written by a third party author. Um, it, the book is never in the curriculum. Parents don't get this book directly. Students never get any of this. And it's actually a book written as I understand for parents who wanna work with their kids through puberty and reproduction. And that's why it is listed as one of dozens of references that parents may choose if they want to, to go further into. So folks keep talking about these images, but sadly, if you were one who fell for it uh, and on social media, you saw these cartoon images posted uh, on an OSPI curriculum, uh, that was meant to get you angry and to get you frustrated and to get you to try to repeal this law. And it's really disingenuous, but please, it is all out there in public. Go to the website, check it out yourself get the facts, listen to both sides of the argument, and ultimately the voters get to choose on this. Uh, but this is about keeping kids healthy and safe. 29 other states do this, including very conservative states, very Republican states. Uh, this became a political issue as a tactic, and I do respect that in politics, but protecting kids shouldn't be political. Thank you. Mr. Rechtel, you'll have 30 seconds now to ask Ms. Espinoza a question for which she will get 90 seconds to respond. Yeah, so, um, Candidate Espinoza, uh, you've uh, been able to vote for roughly 13 years of your life. That's 30 potential votes in your respective communities. You've only voted six times and only really recently since you've been running for office. I'm confident you will vote this time because you were on the ballot and you've worked very, very hard to get where you are. Uh, but I'm curious about a different race. Um, would you please disclose for us um, or not who you're going to vote for for governor, uh, Sheriff Culp or Governor Inslee? Thank you. You have 90 seconds if you'd like it, Ms. Espinoza. Sure. Well, unlike my partisan opponent, I'm not going to allow this office to be partisan. Um, this is, you know, I'm not going to answer a question about who I'm voting for. I don't need people to assume my political motives based on that. I'm looking to be a superintendent for all students, regardless of the way their parents vote. And I'll just add, you know, this is a clear example, very similar, you know, to how sex ed became a partisan issue. This is so similar and characteristic of my opponent to attack those that disagree with him, um, asking for retaliation against those that voted for car tab relief. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to stoop to that level, and I vow to restore the nonpartisan nature of this office. We are engaged in this debate with Maya Espinosa and Chris Reichdahl, two candidates for the position of superintendent of public instruction. This has been a vigorous campaign and a vigorous debate. I want to turn now to a couple of questions for each of you that are a little more personal in nature. Uh, the intent and the purpose of these questions is to allow you a window into who you are as a person setting aside politics for a little bit so that we can uh, get to know you as individuals. So for this first question, Ms. Espinoza, you'll go first and then Mr. Reichdahl will follow up and, and then we'll continue to rotate. But I just ask that you give straight direct questions so we can rifle through some of these here uh, relatively quickly. So first, uh, Ms. Espinoza, what is one book, movie, or play that you think every graduating senior should read or watch? Grit by Angela Duckworth. This will teach kids how to have perseverance and that it's important to have it. And it, it's a fantastic book and I think it's very appropriate for kids leaving high school. Good, Mr. Reichdahl. Uh, I'm gonna choose Freakonomics. It's a fun book. Uh, it is really trying to help people understand how much finance and how much um, the power of money influences just about every one of the decisions that we face. And I think it will help young people really understand their personal finances and also why there are so many political forces at play all the time. I think it'd be a great learning book and it's a lot of fun. Mr. Rechtal, what is your favorite place to pray, reflect, or meditate? Well, I really appreciate that. 
Um, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I consider myself a Christian when I was in elementary school just outside of Snohomish. Um, I pray twice daily. Not very many people know that, and I guess the world knows that now. Uh, one is uh, kind of depending on where I am in the day, and then one is definitely uh, before bed, in my own bedroom. Very good. Ms. Espinoza. St. Francis Cabrini Catholic Parish here in Lakewood. It's where I got married. It's where my kids were baptized. But I do also like to meditate in the park. Great. Ms. Espinoza, if you could have dinner with one person, living or dead, who would it be? Gosh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, probably Warren Buffett, you know, rags to riches kind of guy, makes something out of nothing. And yeah, he seems to be always on the money. So that would be a conversation I'd like to have. Good. Mr. Rechtel. Michelle Obama, unquestionably. Um, I got to be around her one time. My wife got to meet her when my wife was uh, one of the finalists for National School Counselor of the Year. She is a remarkable American, just a beautiful spirit. She reminds us about grace all the time. Um, I get a little bit emotional just given all the attention in the country right now around race, but um, her grace in class is uh, what a first lady and really she'd be an amazing president. So without question, Michelle. Will be. Good. Mr. Reichdahl, every parent will answer this question with their children. So other than your children, of what in your life are you most proud? Um, my wife, <laughs> maybe that was the next answer, but um, Kim is an amazing woman and I love her so much. We've been married for 25 years this last summer, wanted to go to Australia, but obviously with COVID that was tough. Um, we are partners in life. She's a career educator herself. Um, I love her family. Uh, not everyone loves their in-laws, but I have amazing in-laws. And since I lost my mom when I was 20 and my dad at 35, I haven't had parents uh, since I've been a parent. My kids never really knew their grandkids on their grandparents on my side, uh, but I love my wife and our family and uh, they're awesome. Thanks for the question. Yeah, you bet. Ms. Espinosa, other than your children, of what in your life are you most proud? I am most proud of my parents, both of whom served in the military. My dad currently serving overseas. My mom did two tours in Iraq. Um, you know, one of them while I was pregnant with my daughter, you know, and as a military kid being out, you know, without immediate family around to help, it was really hard to have my mom serving, but I'm so proud of the sacrifice they made, you know, both Hispanic American individuals, my dad being an immigrant, I, I couldn't be more proud of anyone than my parents. And I'm thankful that they raised me in such a way to value education and to always keep striving for more, never to limit myself. So I'd have to say them. Very good. We're going to jump back into some policy questions now. Though that was good. I'm in, I'm inclined to keep going with that. I may come back to it. We'll see. I've got a couple others teed up. But Ms. Espinoza, I've got a, a question for you now that uh, starts with data from the Washington Policy Center, which says, and the Washington Policy Center is a right of center think tank, but very well regarded uh, across the political spectrum. Uh, they uh, did analysis showing that in the 2019-2021 biannual budget that was adopted by the legislature last year, that Washington State now spends about $16,000 on average per student in Washington State, according to their research. This followed a bipartisan compromise, of course, that included increasing the cap on property taxes in the state to address the McCleary ruling and the shortfall in f education funding. My question is in three parts, but they're short parts. Uh, do you think that $16,000 is enough per pupil? Would you call to revisit the property cap, uh, property uh, tax compromise? And how would you plan to navigate the looming budget challenges in the next legislative session on education specifically? Yeah, I think part one and three of your question really go hand in hand. Um, is it enough? And what are we going to do, you know, in the coming uh, biennium to address if it's not? Um, I think that's a difficult question to answer, you know, whether enough is enough. I think it's more of a question of priorities. Education spending in our state is our top budget item. And thanks to McCleary, you know, this is supposed to be the paramount duty of our state. So certainly I think we need to spend enough, but that said, we also need to work with the funds that we have, ensuring that um, equal funding for school is, is possible with the funds that we're using. 
I do think that we still rely too heavily on local levies. And it's so unfortunate that we squandered an opportunity with a huge influx of, of new education dollars by still having to, again, lift the levy lid, put property rich districts in an unfair advantage over low income communities. I think this was a real squandered opportunity and I will be working hard um, you know, in this next budget cycle to make sure that our schools keep the funding that we have, but that we take this opportunity to use money in a more creative way that allows for this equity in schools, not the inequity that we continue to foster under this current system. Very good. Mr. Reichdahl, according to reports from Seattle Public Schools, fewer than half of elementary school kids logged into their classroom last spring when the pandemic first started. During its return to school here in the last few weeks, Seattle Public Schools have again seen only about half of their students report to online classes here this fall. Your office, working with school districts like Seattle and state officials in the Inslee administration, has had six months to work on the challenge of educating Washington kids in a distance learning model. Why is classroom engagement amongst our students no better today than it was six months ago? You know, that's certainly not the experience around the state. Um, we've deployed 300,000 devices now, connected 60,000 more families. Um, I've made a priority out of eight or $9 million in federal relief dollars to connect another 50 or 60,000 families over the next month or two here. We just got approval on those dollars recently. Um, and so we definitely know there's a, there's a struggle out there. Now that data was when Seattle had their ramp up days. So these were check-in days, these are not full instructional days. Um, and so that's gotten significantly better, uh, but this is tough. This is really tough. It's why we really want schools open. We built a plan to do that, but it's why local school districts are grappling with that decision on how do you safely bring back students without having the cases explode? How do you do it in a way that if you're bringing students back, let's say they are in groups of five or 10, and the teacher's giving them great instruction in the building. What happens to the 10 or so students who can't come back that day uh, because of physical distancing requirements? And so there's never been a harder time right now to be an educator, a school board member, a superintendent or a principal, and they are absolutely doing their very best to build this out. Um, we've, we've got great connectivity um, for a lot of families that didn't have it in the spring, but we still have deserts in this state that don't have connectivity. It is why the governor, uh, and I did support this, said that buildings need to be made available. If you can't connect a family, if they have an IEP for a student with disabilities and they really need one-to-one -one supports or small group supports, that can happen today right now in our buildings. And we're seeing that in all the reopening plans. Virtually every district said that is our plan if we can't make great connections. So school year is just underway. We're seeing those numbers ramp up. Dozens of districts are now adopting plans to open in person. They need to do that really carefully. If they go too fast, and they don't take the right precautions that are in the guidance and framework we've given them, they will have case explosions, they will shut down again, and we'll be right back to where we are. Very good. Ahead of this uh, debate this evening, we were able to take questions from our readers who emailed them into us. And of course, for our viewers watching now, we have uh, just over a thousand people registered and participating. You can uh, pose questions in the chat box to the right of this video, and you can upvote those. I see a number of them now. Uh, but I will try to take some of those questions here in a minute. I first want to tee up some of these questions that we got from readers in advance of the debate. This first question comes from Tim Canoe, who's the executive director at the Washington Association for Career and Technical Education. And we should note that Mr. Canoe contributed $100 to Mr. Reichdahl, according to the Public Disclosure Commission, but I thought his question was fair and a good one, and I wanted to get it asked. He says, uh, with accelerated changes coming as a result of COVID on education, work and careers will change. How will K-12 education focus on giving students the skills and, traded, and training needed to positively engage in the future economy and society? So a workforce development question. We'll give you both a chance to answer this, but we'll start with you, Ms. Espinoza. Well, I think we can anticipate my opponent talking about the work that he's done so far to promote career and technical education in our schools. And I think that's wonderful. I think we need more of that. And I think that COVID has provided us with an opportunity to do even more robust uh, skills uh, applications in schools. You know, when I was a, a middle schooler, I remember wood shopping and career tech classes, and we've really gone away from those. 
So rather than this incremental approach of, you know, making sure that we have a little bit here, a little bit there, maybe starting one skill center over there. I think now is our chance to really uh, move robustly towards this. I got to see this in Germany, for example, um, where career tech is integral to every single middle school and kids can start getting paid as early, you know, as 16 to be able to um, do some of this hands-on learning. So I think we absolutely need more of it, but I do think that it takes um, a bigger step than what we've seen right now. It's not, you know, baby steps are nice, but I think we have a real opportunity to step it up. Very good. Mr. Reichdahl, you have 90 seconds. Yeah, this is just something I'm very, very passionate about. Uh, the, the way my father survived, even with an eighth grade education, is he had skills. He had, he had a trade and he was able to build and remodel homes and, and do other things uh, with several businesses. About 30% of our economy needs students to have a baccalaureate degree or higher. We literally have some of the best universities in the world in this state. They are amazing. Go Cougs, and I guess the Huskies as well. I love you all. Uh, but about 70% of our students need more than a high school diploma, uh, less than a baccalaureate degree. And so it is about getting everyone skilled so they can earn family wage jobs and be really competitive in the labor market and quite frankly, around the world. That's why we changed our graduation focus to be pathways, not high stakes, federally mandated tests. We said, let's honor what students take. Let's honor our great educators. We brought business together and labor together to build these uh, frameworks and these plans. That's why we have thousands of more kids doing it. And they're taking CTE again as early as middle school, which is exciting. Lastly, Core Plus, this is where our students spend a ton of time their junior year getting the basics of manufacturing, maritime industries, uh, construction trades, and other things. They spend their senior year in very intensive work, specifically around a craft or a trade. They get work experience doing that. It propels them to great success, including degrees, but also straight to work. Uh, we have more than just sort of the want and the passion. We have a plan and a vision and we're executing it. And it's probably why those groups supported my campaign. You call them special interests, but when I talk about taking care of workers and keeping amazing uh, Washington State Very companies good. successful, Thank you. that is partnership. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brenda Rogers. She's the president of the Washington State School Directors Association. And she, she has a little bit of a statement that will turn into a question where she says, I have seen how the lack of universal access to broadband is a major roadblock in providing equitable education services to all of the children in our state. But it's not just education affected by this, it's healthcare and businesses. They also need the infrastructure improved and that I think this issue would, will become top of mind soon. I'd love to see it discussed in your forum. Ms. Rogers raises a good question. So as certainly, certainly a superintendent of public instruction, you're thinking about school buildings and capital infrastructure in that traditional sense. But if our school classrooms are now distance learning classrooms, how will you be working with public utilities, with PUDs and others to make sure that we have enough broadband access in the state? Ms. Espinoza, I'll ask you this question first. Sure, you know, this is something I wrote about years ago when I was in Olympia. Um, the access to broadband and to internet access is as essential as running water and other utilities. Uh, you know, this for me has been obvious for a long time, and it's unfortunate that it took COVID for us to realize, uh, you know, how how vulnerable we were. Um, you know, this, uh, what was her name? You said Brenda? Brenda Rogers, yes. Yeah, Brenda uh, makes an excellent point that this is not just important for education and schools right now, but this is important for adults to be able to get jobs, to be able to, you know, uh, do things online. As, as I say, it's become a, a necessary public utility. And this happens to be one of those issues that has bipartisan support. And I think I would be an excellent champion in moving something forward. It does take, um, you know, people coming around an idea and building support. And it's not just Eastern Washington, of course, that, that suffers from this. There are pockets all over Washington that do not have access. And in our, you know, technological state, we need to make this a priority. It's long overdue, and it's something I've advocated for for a long time. Very good. Mr. Rechtal. Yeah, this is just a powerful moment for the country. Fortunately, we're a state that has been building out a broadband office. Uh, we partnered with them. We've deployed, I believe, more than 100 locations in the state, uh, trying to make sure that those public utilities and those libraries are really equipped, not just to go inside of them to get connectivity, but to essentially uh, broadcast it out further. This is really an ultimate infrastructure question. This country and the state has to commit to infrastructure. It will create jobs, particularly rural jobs. 
But as your question indicates, and thank you, Brenda, I'm glad you asked the question. Um, this is about really empowering everybody. The future of learning in part will be at a distance. We've seen it in higher ed for years. We've been building that out. Uh, we've helped build that out when I was at the community and technical college system. It does take infrastructure. I hope everyone talks to their local uh, member of Congress. It's not a partisan issue. Republican or Democrat, get a hold of them. If there's another CARES Act, another relief package, insist that there be access for infrastructure for broadband. Let's bring it to every community, every single household. Let's make sure everyone's connected. It will also powerfully impact rural economics so that our rural communities have as much success economically as our central Puget Sound does. This is something we can all unite around. I've done the work in it, uh, but now we really need help from the feds and we need partnership and we got to build it out for everyone. Very good. We have gone through the questions that we prepared in advance and we've got about six minutes before closing comments. So I'm going to go to our audience who is engaged as I've discussed on our chat box. And one question that we have not asked you, but which Jonathan Levy Wallens asks, he asks simply, how do we deal with the mental health crisis gripping our schools? There's a lot baked into that from social media to the infrastructure our schools play in terms of supporting families. But just generally speaking, in 60 seconds to each of you, and I'll start with you, Mr. Rechtal, how do we support children and families and their mental health through the school system? I'm really glad you came back to this. I didn't get a chance to talk a little bit about the money question earlier. We see a state like Massachusetts spending five to $7,000 more per student and they outperform us. And we see states like Mississippi and Louisiana and others who have voucher programs, they've cut their budgets and they're significantly underperforming us. Money is not everything in education, but it matters a lot. And one of the places we're recommending to the legislature to continue to build out basic education is in fact mental health, nursing, counseling, school psychs, You've got a wraparound support system that has to be fully built out to complement the great math and the great science. Uh, and mental health is one of them. We've been doing it a, a little bit over the last several years. We need a full-blown investment in mental health. Our kids need it. I'm going to tell you right now that a lot of our educators need this as well. This has been a very tough time. It will have long legs. We have to invest the way Massachusetts does, and we will get Massachusetts results. They put a lot more money into support services like mental health and wraparound. And that is the thing we can do together in a bipartisan way to keep building out our system. Very good. Ms. Espinoza. I think the best way that we can address mental health in our schools right now is to get our kids back in school. This is, you know, we know that kids are suffering right now. One in four school-aged Americans considered suicide in June. This is a crisis, a pandemic, and we are really deeply affecting our kids in ways that we haven't measured yet. Um, I do think that, you know, obviously mental health supports in schools are important. Um, and I think that we have a number of counselors at schools ready to do this work and we need to free them up to be able to counsel students in a meaningful way. So I think there are a lot of ways to get there given the money that we've got. Um, I, I think there's always a good reason to ask for more money, but I do think that the sooner that we get kids back to school, the sooner we address mental health for these kids. Very good. There are a number of questioners in this uh, chat room or chat box that are asking about um, issues of social justice, of race, relation, race relations, and the upheaval that we have seen across the country and here in our state over the last few months. So I'm going to take those and aggregate them into a question and give each of you 60 seconds to address it. How do you see the tool of public education, the tool of that creates the citizenry that holds our country together. How can public education better address and better support the issues of social justice, of racial justice, racial inequity, and those things which have inflamed our society over the last few months and which have of course lingered for generations? What, what role does public education have to address these? Ms. Espinoza, I'll ask you to go first. Yeah, I think schools have known the answers to this for a long time, and it's often teachers that reflect those members of the community that they're serving. Um, I worked in a bipartisan way when working for the Commission on Hispanic Affairs to help pass a bilingual education bill, which helped those bilingual kids become teachers. And if they came back and taught in their community, their student loans would be forgiven. I'm proud of my bipartisan work on issues like this, but I think it speaks to exactly this, this social justice and racial equality issue that you bring up. Kids love seeing and are most responsive to 
teachers that look like them and understand them culturally and, you know, from a community perspective. No one understands this more than me. And as the potential first woman of color in a statewide elected office in Washington state, I think this would send a strong message to our students that we do reflect you, we do value your needs, and they're as diverse as you are. Mr. Reichtel. Yeah, diversifying our workforce is huge, and, and that has uh, really taken off the last several years. Uh, the numbers are certainly getting better, but you have to go way beyond that because the pipeline hasn't been developed for that. We've got to keep working on it. We need action right now, and the legislature's a determination to really embrace ethnic studies, not just to stand alone courses, but to truly, truly understand that every content area is a powerful place to learn about race and justice. And it's, it is, your question was the, the role of public ed. That is exactly what it is designed for. The sons and daughters of African-Americans, of Latinos, of Caucasian families, of recent immigrants, of those uh, with language access barriers, sharing space, learning with each other and from each other. That is how school can be a more equitable place. But you have to be intentional about race. You can't just say it's one of many things. We have a racial problem in this country. This country was founded on the idea uh, that African-Americans in particular, uh, women, men who did not own property could not participate in the democracy. So you've got to intentionally work on these practices and our schools can do that. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, last question until we get to your closing comments, Sarah Butcher and others have asked about how we can reimagine our education system. And let me sort of ask that a little differently by asking, uh, now that we've just gone through this collective up upheaval of COVID, now that we've had time to be reflective on the issues of racial uh, and social inequities, what can we do to make our education system better and different? What will be the things that will linger and last as we reimagine education for the future so that we will have learned from COVID and this summer of discontent? Mr. Reichdahl, what will stick around in the future for 60 seconds? Uh, very intentional screening of students. So rather than 25 come in and they all learn the same thing and then they go to the next class or the next teacher, being very intentional about where students are, more personal uh, analysis and understanding of what students need, being more tailored in our work. Um, that's gonna take resources, of course, but that's the difference. And what we've learned from students being uh, at home or in, in hybrid models is uh, it is not a one size fits all and it can't be. So being very intentional about that, obviously building out an infrastructure of technology will be a lingering component of this. And the last thing I'll say is standards-based learning. We should keep working with students until they master a subject and not base it on seat time or hours or the agrarian calendar. We should give them the opportunity to learn at a pace that is appropriate with all the supports and stop thinking about this as a factory model. It's time to really customize education for every student. Very good. Ms. Espinoza, what will we do differently? What should we do differently as we reimagine education at learning from our experience with COVID and social upheaval? Yeah, as I've said before, I really think this is just an opportunity. It, COVID has provided us with a clean slate, and I don't think we need to resurrect that factory model. Um, I, I don't think it's small tweaks that are going to get us to reimagining an education system. You know, uh, the McCleary decision even stated that pouring more money into an outmoded system will not succeed. And yet that's what we continue to do. So what do I see as how we can reimagine education? I think, you know, the vision can be big and bold. And I think that could be, you know, anything from a, a longer school year to longer school days. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to provide more options and access for families. And I think, you know, when we use terms like school choice, that's not just limited, um, you know, to the type of great public schools that Chris is able to send his kids to, but it's making sure that all of our schools are great and that every family has options to choose right. where to send their students. Thank you. Candidates, I just want to restate my personal appreciation for the slog that you are going through that is running for office. It's, uh, it's an honor as a citizen of our state that you guys both are pouring so much into this and that you're with us here tonight, so thank you. Let me turn to our final closing comments. You'll both have two minutes uh, to wrap up your vision and make the case for your candidacy. Ms. Espinoza, we had Mr. Reichdahl start with opening comments. We'll have you start now with closing comments. 
Thank you. And thank you so much for having me this evening. I know it's late, but this is an important conversation that I'm so glad so many people are now engaged in. I would ask you if you are going to vote to maintain the status quo or if you'll join me in demanding something different. I don't have a blueprint for what that looks like, but I want to represent the needs of parents and families right now and for our future. This doesn't need to be complicated, but we do need to have courage, and I'm willing to do that, and I'm willing to speak for you. Um, I don't think the current administration is preparing our kids, whether it's for college or work or even the real world. He's most concerned with his special interests, as demonstrated by his donor lists, and I'm remaining focused on our students. We are overdue for a school system that meets the demands of the working family and the future economy. A vote for the incumbent is a vote for a system which continues to fail students. We have nearly a 20% dropout rate still and a widening opportunity gap. I really hope that you'll join me in this effort to reimagine education. We have a, a page on our website to share your ideas. I'm open to everything. I've got a vision for what that might look like, but I wanna hear your ideas. These are our schools, and I hope you'll join me in reimagining an education system that actually works for all of Washington's families. Very good, thank you. Mr. Rechtel, you have two minutes for closing comments. Thank you, DJ, and thank you to The Wire and everyone tuning in. Um, we do have a blueprint, that's what's so exciting. We've increased opportunities for students to engage in kindergarten as four-year-olds so that they're ready for school. We're redesigning literacy in early grades so that we can continue to become one of the strongest states in the country. We're bringing CTE back even in the middle school. We're increasing mental health supports. We're focused on success for kids. We've opened up grad pathways. We're redesigning the junior and senior year so it's not a one-size-fits-all, but it's a transition to a student's next step. And we're partnering with higher education to make sure more students transition to whatever that might look like for them. And we're doing all of this at a time where we're intentionally focused right now on better family and parent engagement. So they're really controlling a lot more what happens in their schools, but you balance that with local control. State guidance with the vision and the blueprint we've already built, carrying that out. I have the background in public education, a school board member, higher education, a graduate degree in administration and finance, uh, this is a complicated job at a complicated time that takes real experience and real leadership and a blueprint that's already underway that's getting results. Uh, and we're climbing the ranks across the country as one of the higher performing states. I'm really grateful for the voters of Washington for the opportunity. Um, I would love to earn your vote again. You can check us out at chrisrakedale.org for policy positions, um, our supporters. And I'm really, really grateful that you all hosted this for us. It's a great opportunity to talk uh, to our Washingtonians who control their schools and want for them the best for their kids like I do for my own children. Thank you. Chris Reichdahl and Maya Espinosa, thank you both candidates for the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. And thank you to the just over 1,000 folks who have registered to be with us. Thank you also to our partners at TVW that will show this debate live over the course of the next week or so, multiple times, I'm sure, I hope. Uh, and to the team that put this together that stayed late here this evening, including uh, Chan Peterson, Yoshi, Yoshizumi, Ian Portman, Michael Goldberg, Kriana Wilson, and Rita Waldrop. Thank you for uh, joining us here tonight. Again, stay tuned at Washington State Wire for more coverage of Washington State personalities, policies, and politics. We sure appreciate you being with us. Thanks and good night. Thank you for joining us and for supporting the independent public service journalism provided at WashingtonStateWire.com.